My message is unity as a Christian. Unity as a Christian. And uh, I, um, I think I might have spoke on this subject many years ago. Many years ago. And um, it's something that we all hear about, right? We, we want to have united nights. We want to have unity amongst ourselves. We want to get along. We want to make sure that everybody is kosher with each other, that, uh, you know, we do things the right way in, in a group or in a setting or together to accomplish a goal or a task. And um, unity is something that uh, pretty much brings people together. That's pretty much the definition of it. And tonight I want to read a verse, or a few verses, sorry, uh, from Ephesians 4, 1 through 16. But before I go into that specific verse there, just leave that there. I'm going to read uh, the first book of, uh, the, uh, the book of Ephesians chapter 1, uh, verses 1 and 2, and you guys will understand why. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in in Ephesus, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Paul is the one who writes this letter to them uh, to help them better understand what it means to be united as a Christian, to be in unity. And so I want to read these verses, these 16 verses, and I hope that you guys don't fall asleep, that you stay awake, that you learn, that you grow. Amen. See, if you guys are saying amen, then you guys are still awake. Maybe with one eye open, that's fine. I, therefore, a prisoner of the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit. Just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call, One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. But grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it says, when he ascended on high, he led a host of captives and he gave gifts to men. In saying he ascended, what does it mean but that he had also descended into the lower regions, the earth? The earth, sorry. He had, he who descended is the one who also ascended far above all the heavens, and he might fill all things. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood to the measure of a stature of, a fa- of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow, in, grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. Verse 16 from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which is is equipped which is which it is equipped when each part is working properly making the body grow so that it builds itself up in love amen as i mentioned the title of my message is uh, unity as a Christian, and actually the title of this section in the book is actually called The Unity in the Body of Christ. Does anybody know what a draft horse is? Somebody's like, ooh, I know what that is. It's like these massive horses that uh, you guys probably see online, and they have like these massive hoofs. You guys know what I'm talking about? Some of them are meant for plowing, and they mostly are used for uh, plowing fields and farms. One of these horses can pull 8,000 pounds by themselves. Do you know how much 8,000 pounds is? How much do you think a car weighs? About 4,000, 5,000, 6,000. How much, Chris? You know cars, bro. 
Four or 5,000. Imagine him pulling two cars behind him. Now guess what? When you have two of these horses next to each other, guess how much they can pull? Twice as much? Three times as much? Four times as much? How much do you think you got, they can pull? Give me some answers. 30K. 30K. <laughs> Talking about money here. No, I'm just kidding. Huh? 80K. 80K. That's some good numbers right there. Let me hear some more. 40, 16. It's good. You guys are close. I like that. 24,000 pounds can be pulled by two of those horses if they're side by side plowing a field. That's like how many cars? That's like five, maybe four or five cars that they could pull together. That's insane. So when you have one horse that can pull 8,000 pounds, that sounds like a lot, but when you have two, it doesn't double. It actually triples, quadruples the amount of weight that they can actually pull, which is insane, three times actually. So if these horses, these draft horses are united together, imagine how fast they can plow a field, how much force they can pull and how fast they can go, helping the farmer out, right? You have those tractors out there. This is like two horsepower. <laughs> Probably, I don't know how fast the regular tractors go, but that's some serious business when you think about it. When these two horses are together, they can do an immense amount of work. Now, let me ask you, have you guys uh, heard of stories recently in the past four or five years, three years, last week, last month, of people coming together, things happening together, and they've done great things? I'm pretty sure you guys have, right? Many years ago, you guys uh, heard of the Barnevinet, right? Is where this family was taken away from their parents, and we marched in San Francisco. Do you guys remember that? Yeah, well, we all came together in a massive group for this one cause. From my understanding, at the end of this, there was a resolution. They gave the kids back to the family. It wasn't because one person said something. It was because all of them came together. I still remember that because it was uh, here in San Francisco, and a few, quite a few of us attended that. And many more other people around the world heard about it and stand firm uh, for that cause. You guys heard of the Planned Parenthood trial with Sandra and Harry Mehetz? Do you guys remember that? Uh, Mr. Harry Mehetz was here not too long ago. He's a lawyer in uh, San Francisco, and he pretty much fights uh, some an amazing causes out there in the world. Um, I forgot their company name, but um, they were uh, they were there was this person on trial that exposed Planned Parenthood for selling body parts, and. Um, these uh, individuals came together for that cause, and I believe there was a resolution pertaining to that. These guys spoke up. These guys stood for something. They came together with a group of people, a community. Uh, there was things on, on, online. There were people uh, texting. There were people posting on Facebook about it. It was because a few, not one, not two, but multiple people came together for this cause. How about United States of America? You guys, uh, you guys ever read that slowly? The very first word states it. What are we? United. That's why it's called United States of America, because we're all here together. It's not one person of States of America. <laughs> it's United States of America. And there are great things that happen here in America if we all come together. If we all fight together for a cause, we all come. Hell or high water, we're there. Let's look at it in a biblical sense. What about the disciples of Jesus? What do they do? What did they accomplish when they came together? When they were united, guess what they did? They proclaimed the gospel throughout the world, making disciples throughout the world. Are you guys getting the drift here? When there's people that come together, when people are united, when there's a cause, when there's unity, things can actually get done. What about the church project? Is it one person doing it? Are you sure? <laughs> it's a lot of people. A lot of people have come together over the years to make sure that the ground was taken care of, that the, uh, the concrete was made, that the plumbing was done. We all came together, volunteer work to make that happen so far. 
And guess what? They still need more people and still need the unity between us to make uh, that church come into fruition and to completion. Because I guarantee you, one person can do it. It's just going to take them a lot longer than when it hap- when everybody else comes when everybody comes together. See, Satan came to divide and conquer, but we mon- must not allow that to enter our lives. There's a saying that the devil knows that a house divided against itself will fall, but he also knows that if we come together in unity in our faith, Christ prevails on our behalf. Amen? I can guarantee you guys have experienced that in your life. That if the devil could divide you guys, he can hurt you guys. He can destroy a friendship. He can destroy certain things. But if we come together as one, great things can happen with Christ in the middle. The theme tonight is I want us to look at this this letter that Paul wrote, which was inspired by the Holy Spirit to the local churches regarding unity at that time. As Christians, we can learn the importance of unity through, this, through these verses, and I hope that you guys can grow with me tonight. So to dive straight in, I, wanted to understand, I want you guys to understand what unity and its meaning is. I looked it up. I wanted to know what is the definition of it. Unity is the state of being united or joined as a whole. United or joined together as a whole. What are we doing here tonight? We're united. We're all here, hopefully, learning to grow in our relationship with God. We're united for that cause. But guess what? There's good unity and there's bad unity. Good unity looks like this. Stopping world hunger. Feeding the homeless, coming together as a family, working to expand the, the knowledge of the people around us about the Lord. That's coming together, having park days, that's unity. Hanging out with your friends, that's unity. Doing a family trip, that's unity. When we went to Los Angeles, how many of you guys got to know somebody in your church you guys don't really hang out with? Right? Yeah. You guys got to know your own per- the, the person who you actually sit to next in, in, in your own church. That's unity. And that's a good unity. What about bad unity? What about the Holocaust? That's pretty insane. They all came together and did something. What about abortion? A group of people coming together to do something. What about bullying someone? Usually it's one leader, but there's a crew behind him supporting him. Unity, right? There's good unity and bad unity. But the unity I want you guys to look at tonight is, is extracted from the wisdom of Paul that he wrote in the, uh, this letter to the local churches. So what? let's look at it. Unity of which Paul talks about. Paul wrote 13 letters in the Bible that shed light on the subject to the church, the need to the church and the need for unity. You think that uh, back then they were perfect? They still needed help. You think that we're perfect? After 2,000 years, you would think that we would learn by now. (laughs) But we still need help with that as local churches and the body of Christ. We still need help with that, to tell you the truth. 1 Corinthians 1.10 states, I appeal to you, brothers, dear brothers and sisters, by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no division in the church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. One thought and one purpose. I like how it states that because we as Christians... Need help with that. You know why? Because we're not perfect. We're not perfect people. We come to a church, and guess what? We all have problems. We all have situations. We all have struggles. So it's funny that we come to a church thinking that we're all perfect, all the way from pastor to the guy here at church, last at church, whoever that may be. No one is perfect. 
Yet the Bible states, dear brothers and sisters, may there be, let no division come in the church. Be one mind, united in thought and purpose. Help us with that, amen? Some of the highest goals include sharing the gospel with the nations. <laughs> that's sometimes, that's probably the hardest thing for me. How am I supposed to share the gospel to all the nations? Well, guess what? It starts with one person. It's talking to my neighbor about it. And guess what that person does? They hear it. And guess where they go? They probably go on vacation to Greece. And guess who are they going to talk to? Probably somebody over there in Greece. And from that guy, hearing about unity, hearing about this unity that we need to have in our church, guess what he does? He's going to go talk to another person in India because he has business out there. So guess what? Maybe I am on the right track. <laughs> Maybe I am reaching the, all the nations in some way, if you think about it. <laughs> if it's talking about the church, we need to do that. Another thing that we need to do is care for those in need. Care for those in need. Worshiping together. Along, uh, coming alongside them, loving them, encouraging the people around us. Sharing God's truth. None of this is possible if we have division in our church. None of this is possible. So we need to come together as one mind, one body, united in thought and purpose. And sometimes that's hard because somebody has a certain goal and desire and somebody might have another goal and desire. And they see things a certain way and they want to do certain things a certain way. So sometimes, sure, I could imagine it gets difficult, right? Because somebody has an opinion of how things should run. But it's funny because God said, let there not be any division in our church. Come together. Work together. Be united together so that his name could be proclaimed and glorified through our works here in this church, through the things that we say, through the things that we do, through the actions that we show, share or show. For those of you guys up here in worship, you guys are, guess what you guys are doing? We're following your guys' lead when you guys are up here. So when you guys are on fire for God, hopefully we're on fire for God too. If you're up here and like, man, I don't want to be here. I want to sing this way. Then we feel uncomfortable. <laughs> but good thing that doesn't happen here. You guys are amazing. You guys are great. What you do here has a big difference and a, and a massive change for the people around you. Ephesians 4, 3 states, God wants his people to make every effort to keep the unity of spirit through the bond of peace. Ephesians 4, 3. I also like Galatians 5, 22, 23, which talks about that peace or the spirit. It says, but the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. Make every effort to keep the peace. Growing up in a big family, I was number four. When I lived at home, there was, of course, always division, right? Because, hey, he's not sharing. Hey, he's not giving me a ride somewhere. Hey, why isn't this going my way? Why does this happen for him? Why is he the favorite son? Why is he the favorite? No, I'm just kidding. There, there were no favorites. Everybody's equal. <laughs> And sometimes that happens, right? Kids get mad at each other because he has a toy. Now he wants the toy and so forth. And, and I loved to keep the peace in my own house. I wasn't the best at it, at it but I tried my best to tell my brother, hey, just it's fine. He's growing. Just let him have that toy. Don't worry about it. I'll get you a better one. <laughs> and then they would agree, come together and be united, right? I remember this one story. Maybe it's tangent. I was going to the store. I brought all the kids in our minivan, and we had about eight young kids in our van, and uh, we go to the store. And one of them was like, hey, I got $5. I'm going to buy a bag of candy. And I said, no, you're not. If you want to buy that candy, guess what you have to do? Whatever you buy, you have to share with your brother or sister, even if it's one piece. 
And I remember them thinking, okay, <laughs> they really thought about it. So they didn't buy a, a candy bar. <laughs> they bought a bag that had 100 Starbursts on it. <laughs> the unity, the sharing, right? Keeping the peace. We're all called to that. See, the fruit of the Spirit, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, the, the Holy Spirit is in you. And the fruit of the Spirit are, the, in a sense, the characteristics of God working in you. Love, peace, gentleness, kindness. So when you're walking around, you should be sharing that fruit of the Spirit. Love, kindness, goodness. Make every effort you can. You know what? when it's the hardest? When you don't like that person. <laughs> that's when it's the hardest but God says make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace man the word of God it puts us in our place sometimes <laughs> but that's a good thing because the goal should be one day I see you I see the next person next to you I see my enemies in heaven one day. Isn't that wild? Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 says, Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church, the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standards of Christ. God gave us certain people in our community, in our lives, to help us, to help us mature, to help us grow. He gave these leaders and he empowered them so that they can continue the work that was expressed in Ephesians, in the book of Ephesians by Paul. That's why pastors here, that's why there's assistant pastors, that's why there's uh, a plethora of leaders in our church, that's why there's mothers and fathers, elders, you name it. These guys have a lifetime of knowledge so coming to an age of 32 years old, at the age of 16, I thought I knew everything. At the age of 18, I was like, I think I got it. At the age of 20, I'm like, okay, maybe I don't really got it because now I'm in college. There's so much going on. By the age of 25, I'm like, man, I was really yelling at my mom and dad. I don't remember that. At the age of 30, I'm like, my God, I need the community around me even more. What was I thinking? They've been through things. They've done things. They've seen things. They've experienced things. They are qualified to be called grandpa and grandma because they've been through life. They know what unity is about. They had their, uh, their experiences and their encounters with others in this world. They've walked, they've walked with God. They've learned from the teachings of the Bible. That's why God puts these people in our lives. So the next time you see grandma and grandpa, don't brush them off. Say, grandma, grandpa, what did you do back in the day? Who were your friends? What was your clique like? What kicks did you wear? What did you do? How did you get around town? What car did you drive? What friends did you make? What lessons could I learn? What mistakes should I stay from? What example should I learn from? I'm telling you, ask your grandma, grandpa. They've been through certain things. They've done things. And not only that, talk to pastor. It's uh, talk to the leaders of this church. It's beautiful to hear some of their stories, what they've done with Christ. It's beautiful to hear that back in Romania, I did this and I did that. 
I think I bragged about my father-in-law before. I'm going to say pastor. <clears throat> We're in church, right? You know, he was a pastor for like 15 years, 20 years. I don't know, like how long, babe, in, in Austria? Let's say 15 years, 12 years, I think, or something like that. You know, he started when he was in his early 20s as a pastor. Did you know that he was in charge of, I don't know how many churches, like eight or nine? Did you know that he opened up satellite churches, satellite schools? Did you know that? <laughs> That's pretty wild, right? He's seen things. He's done things. He brought people together for a cause. He's done. I mean, he's been in church all his life, pretty much. And guess what his goal is? And for uh, for us to be united, for us to be taught, to learn, to grow, and who God is and what He wants for us and our walk with Him. So when they speak, dude, Sunday, get a translator if you don't understand. I guarantee you, you're gonna learn a thing or two. When these people speak up on stage, God has given us these leaders, these prophets, these apostles, these pastors, these teachers to equip us to know what it means to be in unity, to get along, to have fun while we're doing it, to not get angry at our neighbor, because <laughs> that happens, right? Romans 12, 4 through 5 says, Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. Ephesians 4, 16 states, He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. I'm telling you, if this finger did not come back, I wouldn't have been the complete whole body. <laughs> As I mentioned earlier, thank God I can do it now. I feel much better, I'm telling you. In the same way, we all have certain talents. We all have certain abilities. Some of you guys like cars. Some of you guys like clothes. Some of you guys like to look pretty. Some of you guys like to do your hair. Some of you guys like to wear nice shoes. Some of you guys have those likes, but also talents to know how to dress, how to take a shower and comb your hair, but also know how to act, know, to, know how to conversate with people, know how to communicate with certain people. You guys all have certain talents and abilities you think you're here on accident? I don't think so. I think you're in this church. I think you're Romanian. I think you're in the family that you're in for a purpose, for a reason, for a cause. God didn't place you there on accident. How many of you guys wish right now you guys were in India and poor and living in a hut? I don't know. I didn't think so. I know. I'm really happy I'm in America. I'm really happy I'm in the family that I'm in. I'm really happy that, sure, I have some quirky friends. I'm really happy that I'm in this church. I'm really happy that I get to know you guys. I'm really happy to even be here in this place. I'm blessed. God has placed you here for a reason. You guys have a purpose. You guys have an ability. God has united all of you guys here together for a reason. And I hope you guys search inside and truly find out what that reason is. That's something that Paul is talking about. This is the unity that he's talking about. What happens when we are not united? What happens when we are not united? We become a dysfunctional body fighting itself, getting nowhere. You guys ever play tug of war? Right? There's two, two sides, somebody pulling on each side. Now, you, <laughs> that's like a dysfunctional body right there. <laughs> it's, hey, guys, let's go this way. And those guys are like, no, I want to go that way because if I go that way, then I get to win. <laughs> no, I want to go this way because my team is going that way. That's what a dysfunctional body kind of looks like. What about our walks with Christ? 
What happens when we become a dysfunctional individual? What does that even look like? I can tell you. We start to gossip. We start to express negative, a negative uh, attitude. We start to sin. We start to push our own preferences. I'm not going to change because this is the way I think. This is the way it should be done. Therefore, this is it. That's what a dysfunctional body starts to look like. If we're, te- if we're talking spiritually and even physically and mentally in your own life. You know who does that the best? You know who keeps us in that dysfunction? Guess what in this world keeps us dysfunctional? Anybody? The devil. The devil will keep you dysfunctional. That's why it's so important when the Bible says where there are two or three are gathered, I am there. Don't get me wrong. God is with you in your walk with you. And there are times where you should be in your spiritual walk, in your prayer closets and whatnot, and on your own devotional times. But there is so much more that happens when two or more come together in, in, in solving an issue, a, a spiritual issue. That's why it states, confess your sins to one another. Somebody that you trust, of course. Because that guy can keep you accountable. That person can pray for you spiritually. That person can walk with you and say, hey, I'm watching you. I want, to, I want the best for you. The devil is what dif- uh, keeps, us un- uh, keeps us dysfunctional, not united. So be careful, guys. Be careful in your walk with Christ. Be careful when... When you start to hear, you know, hey, should I gossip about this person or should I not? Stay away from that because that's where the division starts. That's where the devil wants to grab you and hold you and keep you away from everything else that's happening at church. You guys ever have an opportunity of not going to church? Hey, my parents are out of town. I'm home by myself. Do I need to go to church on Sunday? No, because I can do whatever I want. I don't need to go. Well, that's the devil telling you in your mind, don't go. Don't be part of that. Go go, go watch a game. Go do something else. That's what the devil does. Because he wants to keep you separated, not united with the church, not united in our functions, not united in our community. Our human nature, preferences, and differences, interpretations of the scripture can cause disagreements. Typically, when differences are devised, our mission becomes blurred and we are ineffective. That's why it's so important to read the word of God and interpret what it says. You guys ever uh, did inductive Bible study? That's diving in your word, that's diving in the Bible and actually taking word for word. When the word but or if or and comes up, you're like, whoa, red flags. He said one thing, but another thing. You should, uh, because of sinning, you should die. But because of Christ, you have an opportunity at salvation. But is the... Is the word you guys should look out for because it tells you the truth and it tells you what the Bible is expecting from us in our walk with him. Inductive Bible study. It's a world of a difference when you start to read the word and not interpret the way you think the Bible states. God has mandated that our conduct positively impacts the church's unity. This is essential if we are to accomplish his purpose. That is what God wants from us. It is his, that is the purpose, to be united. And it's essential for us to be united. If we're trying to win souls to Christ, we need to be united. <clears throat> so what are some applications here very soon in closing that we can do in our walk with Christ to be more united. 
One, read your word. Read your word. Understand what the word is saying. And what's our purpose as Christians? Because if we want to know what unity is all about, then we should be reading our word because it gives you many examples in the Bible. Through the apostles, through the things that happened with Jesus, gives you many examples of what unity looks like when they're all in one accord, not the car, but together for the purpose of bringing people to Christ. The Bible shares many stories and examples. Number two, pray constantly so that we do the Lord's will and not our own. Matthew 18, 20 says, For where there two or three are gathered, in my name there I am with them. Guess what's coming up in a few weeks? I don't know if Pastor mentioned it or not. But every single year we do a week of prayer. Here at the end of July or beginning of July, if I'm not mistaken, we want to do a few days of prayer. Staduinsa. Uh, and so that's a place where we can come together and start praying for one another. That's a place that we can start praying for ourselves, our walk with him. God, help me. I have a problem. I gossip too much. I'm not a fan of the guy next to me. Because the way he looks, the way he talks, the way he is, God help me. I have these stubborn, stubborn uh, choices in my life that I don't want to change. But God, please soften my heart because I know that if you do, then it's going to help the benefit of the church. It's going to help the people around me. Pray constantly. God help me. What is unity? God, reveal it to me. Give me the opportunity. Help me to implement it. And help me to continue to move like you in this world. Number Three, walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.22, as I mentioned earlier, says by the Holy Spirit, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. I think I stated this earlier, uh, not too long ago in my sermon. says the kind of fruit in our lives. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit, the word fruit in our lives. Did you understand the word fruit does not have an S on the end of it. It doesn't say fruits. Fruit. One. Love, joy, peace, kindness, patience, goodness, faithfulness, etc. Guess what that is? The fruit, it means all of them at once. So when you start to follow Christ, all of those things should be and should be shown in your walk with Christ because God starts to put that in your life. He starts to show you what patience is like. He, sh- he starts to grow you in what it actually means to be good and kind and faithful in, his, in your walk with him. All of those happen at once. So when you pursue Christ, these things should start radiating off of you. People should be questioning, who are you? What something is different about you, man? Walk in the Spirit. Number four, the Lord knew we needed partners. <laughs> Understand that the Lord knew what He was doing when He was talking about unity. You guys will find out later on in life. Partners in marriage. There's two. Look at Jesus, look at, the, look at uh, God, look at the Holy Spirit, three in one. What about work? Sure, you can, have, you can be an entrepreneur, you can do a task on your own. But most of the time, most places, most locations, you have a crew of people that come together to work together for a certain goal. Hey man, this company needs to meet a status quo, we all need a... We all need to crank up our abilities to make this happen. Pretty much in most everything that we do, we need to be united. Imagine you're walking this earth by yourself. That would be weird. (laughs) I mean, cool, but you're all by yourself. Human race. (laughs) We're all in it together, guys. 
Just remember that you could do more and more than you could imagine when you work with people, when you grow with people, when you collaborate, when you are united in one front, one idea, one cause, one purpose to do something great. When people come together, more things could actually happen. Hey, you want to fix your car? You could probably learn on YouTube. But imagine having a friend who knows somebody who can work on your car with you. He's like, hey, man, I have a plethora of knowledge. I know how to change the bearings on your car. I know how to change your back brakes. I know how to swap an engine. Hey, you need a guy that uh, does flat tires? Hey, I'm your guy. Well, now you know somebody. You guys are united. You conversate. You talk. You communicate. God knew what he was talking about when he created you and when he created mankind in general, that we need people, that we need to be united for things to be done. So pursue unity in your walk with Christ. Pursue unity. It will change your life completely. Let's go ahead and stand. Unity of the Spirit is important. It is so powerful, it can stop division. It can empower a church and hold believers on task. Taking our eyes off of Jesus is a sure fire way to invite division, discord, and eventually demise. But the Lord knew, and the Lord help us, Lord help us learn from your word to grow spiritually and to be united. Amen. So in this next prayer, let us come before God and ask him, God, help us in our walk with you. Help us to be united. Help us to learn what Paul has stated here in the book of Ephesians, to walk in a manner worthy of the calling. We're all called to something in our walk with Christ. So when you leave tonight, (laughs) when somebody wants something or is asking for something, don't just brush them off. Say, hey, man, how can I help? What can I do? Is there something that I can do? Maybe I have a talent that you might need help with. And just a life lesson. I'm learning as I grow and learn. And I know this is usually like somewhere I could, give, I could have given an example. But something that I learned now that I'm 32 is be united always. Sure, you might have differences between one another. And that's okay. God made us individually, uniquely, creatively. Um, But just a small life lesson, don't burn bridges. Sure, you might be mad at somebody when you're 15, when you're 20, when you're 25. (laughs) But later on in life, you just might need that person to help you with a task, with a role, with something. So don't burn bridges. Say goodbye nicely. <laughs> It'll go a long way. It'll go a long way because what you're, you're feeling right now is not going to be the same feeling in 10, 20 years from now, potentially about somebody or about something. So just grow with Christ. Ask him to unite us. Amen. Do you guys want to be united? That's right, because we're going to camp, and you have to be. And you can't get mad at each other, so you have to get to know each other and uh, deal with each other's differences. So with that being said, I want us to pray for unity in our church, unity in our community, unity in our congregation, in our homes, in our families, between brothers and sisters, in our work on the road. This coming up camp that we have, that everybody's united in one front, one goal, one to have fun, to learn about God, to grow. Unity in our community, but also in the United States, man, we need that. Amen? So that, with that being said, let's come together and just pray for unity and that God continues to grow us in that. Amen.